many of you would know the World Economic Forum as a multi-stakeholder platform. Right? Uh, we try to bring together partners uh, from uh, the public sector, the private sector, various communities to look at how we can uh, jointly address global issues. And one of the things that we try to do a lot is to see how we can better connect science, business and policy. Right? Uh, and this session for the climate and nature agenda is extremely critical because uh, the scientists for the first time uh, from around the world have actually uh, published their research on uh, safe and just corridor for humanity. Right? It was published in the Nature uh, magazine and spoken about in Davos earlier this year, right, after many years of working. And today we're very delighted to have two of the Earth Commissioners join us to share their work. Uh, there are two uh, areas that I'd like you to point your attention to. The first is that it actually provides the interconnection between climate with other dimensions of the global commons, whether this is biodiversity, it is with water, it is with air, it is with phosphorus, nitrogen cycles, which are often not spoken about or not as well uh, known uh, among uh, leaders. Right? Uh, so they'll share a little bit more about how they're thinking about these various interconnections. The second very critical uh, aspect of this piece of work is that it is the first time, I would say, right, that the natural scientists are actually working with the social scientists. Right? Uh, and that's quite unusual and it's also very important because when we think about transitions, transformation, you really need to think about the social aspects and putting people at the core of this transformation work. Right? And they actually brought together the social scientists Right, to work together with the climate scientists. And that's why this piece of work is actually called a safe corridor for humanity, but also thinking about a just corridor for humanity. Right, uh, so I'm not going to say too much because uh, I'm going to uh, kick off and, and get Ta He, who is the co-chair of the Earth Commission, right, to share more of the findings and then followed by Xie Mei. Uh, so Ta He, the floor is yours. Thank you, Yeah. Hello, 很高兴今天和白雪梅女士一块儿呢 and we can see that there are a lot of components of our Earth system. So we selected several dimensions, aerosols, climate, biosphere, freshwater, fertilizers, nutrition. So these five aspects are quite important. So first of all, they are important components of the Earth system, but they are also interconnected with social economic development. So on May the 31st, on a social launch and the press release, so this is a picture taken of the offline uh, event. Uh, Miss Bai is uh, the first one on the left bottom. Uh, it's a pity that I cannot get there. So our topic today is to building safe and just corridor for humankind. 1.5 degrees centigrade, this limit is not ju just enough. We also need other dimensions and other boundaries to safeguard our Earth. So we've been doing this work for three years. So on winter Davos in January, we have outlined this new era of Earth, which is called Anthropo, uh, Anthropocene, and it's a very detailed report, and Jim is also the moderator of that meeting. Uh, we are going to tell, we wanted to tell the world what is the emission situation, so what is the Earth system conditions, and are, can we rebound back to previous conditions? So before uh, May the 31st, the, the release of the paper, uh, we've received wide attention of more than 40 countries, and uh, 2,000 papers have been covering our report. And I know all of you have um, heard about IPCC's fifth assessment report, 
它的安全的攻击那个通道的话呢，我们关系窗口很快就关闭了，我们继续排放，陆续排放地球的环球的大礼，然后关闭了，所以我们这个这点还不够啊，光有这个，我们地球上面光有气候不够的，还要关闭地球的大礼，比如说水的问题，生物多样性的问题，作物的问题，环境的问题，连在一起，共同来保持我们的健康和发展，来保护地球的发展，来保护地球的发展，来保护地球的发展，来保护地球的发展，来保护地球的发展，来保护地球的发展，来保护地球的发展，来保护地球的发展，来保护地球的发展，来保护地球的发展，来保护地球的发展，来保护地球的发展，来保护地球的发展，来保护地球的发展，The social, the Earth system trends, and on the right is social economic trends. So, actually, on the right is the Earth system trends, on the left is social economic trends, and we can see this dramatic change happening back in the middle of last century, 1950s. And we call this a new era, anthropocene. So this is when human activities seriously impact the Earth system. So from 1750, when steam engine was invented, the huge emission of CO2 began to lead to a rise of global temperature. And human impact has exceeded the impact of natural drivers. And after World War II, with the rise of Economies across the world, including some of the emerging markets. So that's around 1950. So that's why we call it a new era, Anthropocene. And the geologist needs a new term. And this still has been disputed. And one of the key issues is carbon emission, and this is IPCC's report, and accumulated emission of carbon leading to a rise of concentration of CO2s in our atmosphere, and ultimately leading to high temperatures, as we can see in Tianjin and Beijing, consecutive uh, 40 degrees centigrade in the day, uh, it's quite phenomenal. So from 1850 to 1900, it's the first period, the gray area, the accumulative, the total emission is 2.4 trillion tons of CO2. And here on the chart, the unit is measured in gigatons CO2. So by that time, it's about two, uh, 2,400 gigatons. But with this trend going on, in 2050, the SSP5 to 8.5, this is the high emission scenarios, uh, will lead to 3 to 5 degree temperature rise. So we can see that industrial production emissions is the uh, key driver of global temperature rise. And another important uh, sensitive impact of or driver of global uh, temperature is cryosphere, uh, which is composed of water uh, that is found in its frozen form, for example, glaciers, ice sheets, snow cover, etc., etc. Uh, also including like ice range. There are three key things here. First of all, it impacts the in radiations of the globe. Uh, of the globe. Second, it also impacts our water resources because they are solid reservoirs. Once they are melt, uh, a lot of water re uh, reserve will be gone, and uh, will have a huge impact on our uh, ecology and ecosystems, and will lead to uh, uh, bio migrants. One example here. For example, uh, echo refugees in uh, western China, there are like snow mountains in the midstream, there are oasis, and in the downstream is the desert. So when global warming keeps going and the glaciers and the snow mountains melt, then the midstream oasis will disappear. And then uh, there are consequences that happen to downstream. So in the past, uh, the lowland country, which disappeared somehow mysteriously, is actually an example of that. So it actually uh, interfered with our uh, livelihood. 
For example, in Xinjiang, there's a huge halving of a, a glacier in uh, Xinjiang province. So uh, cryosphere is really a sensitive uh, parameter. And for uh, other factors, I will invite Professor Bai to explain to you. So knowing the audience in this room, you are familiar with the term, what gets measured, gets managed. So we can think of this Earth system boundaries as a set of health indicators, providing a comprehensive assessment of the health of the planet, and also help guiding cities and businesses in evaluating their risks and performances. So how this can get operationalized? So the first key point of this story, as Dahe has already mentioned, is that people and planet are interconnected. Human societies has been undermining the critical life-supporting systems of the planet, causing major um, disruptions, socioeconomic disruptions worldwide, and major inequalities. Death, diseases, displacement, dispossession, impact on income and livelihood, and impact on water and food securities. So as expectations and scrutiny on the sustainability effort increase, the long-term resilience of businesses, cities, and countries will really hinge on their ability to be able to measure, accurately measure, and manage their impact on the planet and people. So the good news these Earth system boundaries account for both the resilience of the Earth system as well as the human well-being in an integrated framework to help the actors to meet these challenges. So for those of you who are into numbers, you can see some of the top-line boundary numbers from here. But I really recommend you to watch Johan and Joita's um, presentation at Davos for details. The sobering news, as you can see here, our analysis shows that human activities have pushed almost all the Earth system state across the threshold and into the risk zones. We have very short time period, a window of opportunity to really take up the responsibility and take urgent action and start moving back into the safe and just boundaries. So how does this affect cities and businesses? This map shows the areas in the world where most of the boundaries are already breached. So you can see the highest density of these breaches in the areas of bright green, oranges, and red areas, and the lowest density in dark and light blue. But science shows that the real cause of these breaches actually lies in geographies somewhere else. So really, the responsibility lies somewhere else. In climate, for example, the recent IPCC report has shown us that over 70% of all CO2 emissions can actually be traced back into cities. And we already know that the vast majority, over 90% of the CO2 emission of a typical company, comes from their value chain. But cities and companies are more than the corporate. They actually hold some of the biggest potential to actually help us move back into the safe and just boundaries, spaces. They can, these actors, they can really take actions, nimble actions, very often ahead of their national government. And we know urgent actions can move us back into the safe and just boundaries. And collaboration between cities and companies mayors and CEOs are really central in this progress. So
So this work, the quantification of safe and just boundaries, really marks the start of a new chapter in sustainability thinking for cities and companies. So these boundaries can really help the leaders to understand what is their fair share of resources and responsibilities. And leaders really need to set science-based target accordingly. Time-bound and actionable target that can really collectively ensure us to stay within the safe and just boundaries. An Earth system is collaborating closely with the science-based target networks to try to inform how we can translate this new Earth system boundary science for cities and businesses into actionable targets. And operating within these planetary limits is really the opportunity, the business opportunity of our lifetime. In the short run, these boundaries can provide opportunity for businesses to really stay ahead of the regulatory scrutiny and really meet the expectations of increasingly conscious um, consumers and stakeholder bases. And in the long run, they can help protect communities, economies, and the natural resources upon which their operations depend. So the science really calls on the leaders, ministers, mayors, and CEOs to do three things. First, think beyond climate. Adopt a whole systems approach towards sustainability and really understand the impact and start set science-based targets across all of the Earth system domains. And number two is factor in people. Really start measure the impact on people as well as on the planet and take action to improve the well-being um, well and then reduce inequalities. And finally, really work together. Our upcoming analysis really shows that the top 200 emitting cities and top 500 emitting companies, they very often co-locate, but they're not necessarily working together. So there's a large untapped opportunity here for these cities and companies to keep their target ambition abreast. And for the national government, really try to empower them and enable them. So try to set the target, science-based target, as ambitious as you could, and then look across to the mayors of the city that is hosting your business, or to the CEOs of the business that are located in your city and really bring them along the journey. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Xie Mei and uh, Da He for sharing the very sobering findings. Uh, I would now like to invite the floor to either comment or ask questions. Yes, the lady in white. Thank you so much for... If you could start with a brief introduction of who you are. Sure. And then, yes, thank you. Um, my name is Tara Ayer. Um, I work at the IMF, uh, so the International Monetary Fund. Um, so it's a very interesting presentation. Thank you so much. I'm just wondering uh, a couple of things, like how... So by 2050, uh, so the world is starting to reach net zero. And I'm just sort of wondering what your take is on the amount of climate finance that's needed to be mobilized from the private sector side, and also your opinion um, on, on how you know, governments and international organizations could help uh, play a role in that. Thank you. Thank you. Her, her question is, uh, how do we mobilize, right? Uh, given the timeline, uh, she mentioned 2050. In fact, I think we have much less time to act because many of the decisions today uh, many of the things that need to be done, the decisions have to be taken today, right? How do we mobilize businesses and governments uh, to really take action and translate what you've shared today into uh, decisions? Now, um, I don't 
really know much about how to mobilize the financial system, but I do know that um, what is important is really mobilize the subnational actors. Because as we said, um, the cities and companies, they are really holding the possibility of, of doing much, much more than what they're doing now. So I think um, the things we can do is really um, recognize and encourage some of the front runners, front runner cities and front runner companies. And then, you know, really recognize their efforts and then really encourage them to, you know, reach across and then bring others, some of the ladders along the journey. I think, um, you know, really start from bottom up would be really key, in my opinion. Okay, I'm Carbon very actively. Now, the biggest emitters of the world, for example, the US, China, all have, and the EU all have made very important promises, and I believe this would play a very important role. But again, I'm not an expert in finance. Thank you. Yes. Good afternoon. My name is James from Ghana. I teach at the University of Ghana, and I also Maybe a bit louder. Okay. Yeah. And I also research on resilient cities. So my question is, the ordinary people in developing countries like Africa are more interested in livelihood, what they can eat on a daily basis. So the attention is not really on the effect of climate change. So my question is that, what are the incentives available to ensure that the ordinary people in urban areas of the developing world will come on board to solve this climate change challenge? That's a very good question. Yeah. Indeed, um, this is a very good question and actually a very important one. In our, I mean, my work and my group's work on urban environment and urban sustainability, we have always been saying, you know, the priorities are different uh, between developed and developing countries, and you do really need to take into account the, the context. But the, the thing is that um, the livelihood, the daily, you know, the, the food and the water will be really heavily impacted by climate change. So I think the key is that how can we get this sort of message across and raise the awareness, not only the leaders, but also the general public, so that they understand within the next five or 10 years, really in the short you know, term, short time period, that these things are interconnected and they will be really heavily impacted by climate change. And then I think um, the understanding will grow and then there will be increasing you know, pressure from the public to the politicians to take actions. I think so, you know, raising the awareness about the interconnections will be really a key starting point. Do you want to add? Very important question. You mentioned developing countries in Africa, ordinary people need to face problems in terms of food and survival. And actually this is the same case in China. So first of all, I think university education is very important. We need to raise also the public literacy in this regard. Secondly, the government should play a bigger role. For example, the IPCC has the requirement on the financial support to developing countries in climate change. So uh, we need to uh, use that well too. Thank you. Any other comments, uh, feedback from the floor? Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, for the, uh, um, 
for the problem that we are solving is uh, a nexus uh, challenge uh, of nature, climate, and multiple uh, indicators. As we see uh, so many outreach uh, categories, uh, what are the key uh, solutions to uh, sort of find this uh, integrated uh, approach uh, to avoid trade-offs between we are managing one uh, indicator and having negative impact on the other? Is machine learning or the other methods we're deploying? Who will be the initiator to start this integrated approach? Thank you. approach, um, systems understanding is really key to this. And I, I do understand that this is really against the inertia of our you know, decision-making system of our institutions and everything. So probably the first um, step is really change the mindset of our leaders and of our decision-makers to recognize there's this interconnectedness between different things and try to take you know, as comprehensive a systems view as possible. Because we do know that, you know, in reality, in many of our cities, you know, the same street get dug up, you know, several times because, you know, water pipe or energy, you know, line, electricity line, or the other time might be the waste, you know, pipeline. So can we really, you know, have a more systems approach, have a better communication, even within one city government, so that we don't really have to do that sort of thing? So I think start with the mindset change probably is the most important point. One of the terms we coined earlier this year was the notion of a polycrisis, right? Uh, and we saw that uh, when the war broke out uh, in Ukraine, uh, it led to supply chain uh, disruptions, which very quickly also led to food and water security issues, uh, which were made worse by environmental conditions and, and uh, crises, extreme weather events that was happening, right? And how each of these crises are interlinked, and in fact, we call it a polycrisis because it's not a one plus one equals to two, it was one plus one equals to three or more, right? Creating uh, consequences that were much worse than each crisis on their own would exert on our systems, right? Which is why we call it a, a polycrisis. And uh, what Shemay just highlighted, the need for systems transformation is a very critical one because we also know that you can't blame any single actor you also cannot rely on any single actor to respond and to solve the problem. It has to be a multi-stakeholder approach. It has to be systems thinking. And in fact, I just walked past one of the hub sessions, which is, can an environmental crisis trigger a financial crisis? Right? Uh, and that, those are the kinds of questions we need to ask right? and how we can actually think about systems change, whether it's land, food and ocean use. That's one uh, key system whether it's around buildings, urban development, right? That's another system, right? And the third one is obviously energy and extractives, right? And how across each of these systems, we need to think about how do we transit them into a much more environmentally sustainable, right? Uh, but also, right, uh, more affordable, right? Uh, so it supports development objectives, right? And also better living and healthier lifestyles for all of us. And we know that that's possible. Right, so there, there needs to be a lot more cost, cost correction right, uh, that we need to do. I think what we're doing here with the scientists is let's bring the scientific evidence, the facts, to the table and let's uh, work very closely with scientists to turbocharge solutions. Right? Uh, I think uh, we are running out of time and the window for action is closing. Uh, we need to really, uh, for all of you here, if you could actually help amplify uh, this science that the scientists have worked on uh, but also work very closely within your communities and within your own uh, areas of influence to get this systems change going, right? Uh, I think we'll be in a much better s space to, uh, to, to respond in good time, right? Uh, so um, I do want to ask whether our speakers have any concluding remarks before we close the session. Yeah, Shemi? Well, I think the key take home message would be really remember that the earth is finite. We have a finite um, amount of resources and um, you know, pollution assimilation um, capacity and there is a boundary to the earth system. 
时间的窗口关闭很快就到了，仅仅是气候地球的。如果加上生态系统、社会经济，如果我们想到我们的气候、社会经济和生态系统，所以时不时的关闭，更快的关闭。So we need to act fast, and also we need to cooperate with each other. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you.